Welcome to the only rugby show. It's great to have you with us. I'm Louise Rance and we've got the band back together. Joining me, former Wallabies, Drew Mitchell and Stephen Hoyles and rugby personality and commentator Sean Maloney as well. Guys, great to see you all. What a turbulent couple of months it's been around the world and also in rugby. We're going to get through it, but guys, how are you surviving at the moment? Yeah, look, pretty good. I'll I'll start, guys, because I've been in uh, self-isolation for quite a while because out of the team that we've just got back together. I've been in this situation for a bit, of, a little bit longer than the rest of you. I was uh, out, of, out, of the, out of all of us here today, I was the first to be let go. So they, in but some ways- Actually, in some hang ways, on a second. I've got to check you on that. You weren't the first yeah, no, to let sorry. go. That yeah, goes sorry, to me, sorry. number one. Yeah. Yeah, you're about six months ahead of me. I'm sorry, but- um, <laughs> but Technically speaking, Sean worked at Fox Sports for about two years without turning up. So Sean- <laughs> <laughs> you, you did have another job to go to, to be fair, but I've- um, you know, in some ways, I've got a lot to thank uh, Fox Rugby for, other than just the opportunity they gave me, but also to kind of get myself, myself used to uh, self-isolation before self-isolating was actually a thing. So um, I've been at home uh, writing this thing out solo. I've exhausted pretty much every TV series you could think of. Um, there's now like no, obviously no live sport uh, to, to watch either. So I've had to find other ways to uh, to keep me busy and, and occupied and get the brain ticking over and. Um, you know, some have been a little bit more successful than others, but uh, look, I picked up the paintbrush. I've started painting. I'm not a painter. Uh, I've started a business, which is what you do when there's a pandemic on and everyone's losing their jobs. You just try and get something off the ground when no one's got any money. Why not? Yeah, uh, but it's, it's and, an alcohol uh, business, Drew, and people are drinking a lot of alcohol, so it's very good. <laughs> <great. laughs> Cheers to that. <laughs> Could be a good move. What about you guys? Uh, Shawnee, what have you been up to? Well, I've been doing a bunch of stuff with uh, World Rugby, so I've been doing Instagram Lives and all that sort of stuff, a bunch of podcasts. And I've got to say, team, he's really, really underselling himself on the paint side of things. Drew has managed to craft this incredible Jonah Lomu piece <laughs> signed by Drew Mitchell. Great depth of field, lovely use of colours, and it's a tribute to the big man who actually t- would have turned, I think, 50 last week. So don't sell yourself uh, short there, Drew. And Hoylesy, I've got to ask you, why are your kids calling you Ralph Wiggum from The Simpsons at the moment? I've got to know. No, no, no. We're calling my, my youngest son Ralph Wiggum. Basically, he's got very straight hair, um, a lot of antics that remind us of, of Ralph. He's the fourth child. He's kind of – he's the black sheep at the moment. So he's, he's, a, he's keeping us amused. It's been a busy – Busy time in lockdown, but kids are back at school, and um, we're starting to enjoy it. You know, the first few weeks are a little bit stressful. It's not a good time to be a, a rugby coach, commentator, or gym owner. Let's be honest. Three jobs went in three days, so um, we, we're not picking ourselves back up, and and, uh, and we're drinking a lot, a lot more than we used to. Uh, and, and you know, that's not a lot considering that's two drinks a day. You're three beers a week now, are you? <laughs> yeah, and, and that has me like you know wet in the bed type behaviour. So it's. Um, oh, no. <laughs> It's been good. Too much. Yeah. Too much. Well, guys, Lee, what have you been, been doing? Um, oh, what have I been wait, doing? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. Hang on a second. You don't just get to throw it up and then have us hanging on each other. What have you been up to? <laughs> my, my, it's been more, much more boring what I've been doing, though. I've just been cooking and doing a little bit of running, a bit of yoga, trying to keep busy. No painting. You've been working, though, Luke. You've been working. Yeah, a little bit of working. Just starting to work. Well, I've got work. There's a difference. But, yes, I'm very lucky Luke. to have some work going on. Did I also did I also hear you say running? Yeah, I know. So Drew's been at me for like probably eighteen months to like actually go for a run, maybe, you know, three Ks, nothing, and I've refused every single time. But I've started now, not very far. So oh, that's you know. good. There's always opportunity in things like a, a pandemic or a crisis, right? <laughs> exactly. We've got to find something to do, that's for sure. Um, guys, lots has been happening the last couple of months uh, off the field with rugby. I know we've all been sort of watching on um, you know, sometimes frustrated, sometimes just not, not knowing what's going on and where it's all sort of going to be heading. So that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about initially in terms of rugby. Well, I might go to you. The, the state of the game at the moment, the resignation of Raylene Castle, we watched that all play out. It was sort of in the papers and, and quite messy watching on from afar. We've now got the appointment of Rob Clark. What's your, I guess, overall feeling of, of where we're at at the moment and what's transpired in the last few months? 
It's been a pretty difficult time, Lou, and it hasn't been good to watch for anyone involved in rugby. I didn't like how the process that which saw Raylene resign. I've always thought we've needed big change for a while. The problem we face now is that, you know, unless we make dramatic changes at board level and we look completely different, we're going to have the same problem in 12 months' time. You know, Bill Pulver, you know, he was crucified for the job that he did. Raylene was crucified. John O'Neill, Gary Flowers, they've all been crucified in that role. So it tells you that the, there's something wrong with the, the system and the setup, not actually the, you know, the operational side of things. And, and let's, let's not forget the operational side of things has not been perfect. But I do believe that because we've got to the position we're in, that we'll see some positive change out of this. I, I'm really hoping that they make some, some brave and some tough calls. And I don't think we're going to have a short-term fix. I think we're going to have two or three years of, of a lot of pain at the professional level. Um, and, and the priority has to be making sure the Wallabies is successful. And that, that might mean picking players from overseas for the next, you know, two years. If we have to do that to make the Wallabies successful, we do. But at the same time, we've got to get our professional model right here in Australia. Like kids and juniors and schools footy, I've always thought that's been pretty healthy here for a long time. Of course, things can, can be tweaked and, and things will never be perfect. But I really do think that it'd be nice if we look at a, a completely different competition from Super Rugby. And, and I'd, I'd actually probably at this stage now, it'd be nice to see what some of those suggestions are. I think we'd probably go too public with our polit- political side of the game and we're not public enough with the, with the strategy and the options. So we sit here as rugby fans going, well, we don't know what they're going to do. Are they going to do super rugby? Is it going to be club rugby? Is it an NRC? Like, what, what are the options? And I think we could probably be a little bit more open with the public with that stuff. Drew, how do you see the next couple of years panning out? What would you like to see happen? Yeah, look, I think the, um, the biggest thing, right, ne- negativity and frustration is born through through fear and, and fear can be, I guess, alleviated by, by clarity. And that's the one thing that we haven't got in the last 12 to 18 months. And certainly in these last sort of three months, there's just no one being, doesn't seem like, you know, fans, but also the rugby Australia itself don't really seem all too clear about where we're heading. But the good thing in, in saying that is that we do finally have a little bit of clarity and that's that Rob Clark is going to be the, the interim CEO. And I say interim because he's made it known that he doesn't, he has no interest in being the long-term CEO of rugby Australia. So that means then that the board can go away and use due process and due course to go through and find the candidate and appoint the, the, the right candidate to take Rugby Australia on and move forward uh, long term. So at least at the moment where we sit, we do have a little bit of clarity in terms of who's going to be um, steering the ship and moving us forward. Um, and then, like you say, see, there's so many different elements where we have to address. And, uh, you know, that's obviously from pathways to community, to, to engagement, to the TV but also to getting uh, the Wallabies back up and, and winning again because they're, they're our flagship team and you know Rugby Australia and then the engagement with fans in Australia are always at its highest when the Wallabies are doing well. And I, I agree in some ways, I think that at least for the next 12 to 24 months, we probably should pick outside of our Australian borders or outside um, that law that they made in uh, 2015. Um, what was that law that called? Law, was the it the Ghetto Law? Or yeah. have, we, have we renamed uh, it look, now? <laughs> yeah, like the, the, the Mitchell it's, law. It's the Gitto law. Yeah, look, I mean, everyone knows it's probably look, it was about me, but um, Gitz is a high profile, <laughs> so we use his name. So um, anyway, we'll, we'll go off these coattails. But but it, that, like in all seriousness, I think you know for someone like Dave Rennie coming in, he's already got a big task at hand at, already with uh, with the state of the game in our country. But we need to make his task even easier by allowing him to pick the best players. And it's you know I know I know he's sort of already come out and said that he doesn't have too much interest in picking players from overseas, but. You know, we we we, kind of, we need to start seeing results, and you know, well, the Irish series obviously not going to go ahead now. But once he, once the Wallabies do start to kick off, you know, getting results right off the bat for him and the team would really help with just even just the the dialogue around rugby supporters that the Wallabies are starting to do better, and and we can start having a bit more um, positive conversations about rugby rather than the, probably the the more negative type of ones that we've been having for a little while now. Fairly significant appointment as well in this last week with Hamish McLennan being, in, uh, I guess, awarded the right to be chair of Rugby Australia. Guys, what can you tell me about how that kind of works in terms of how the rest of the board is shaped and then the CEO as well? So am I right in saying that the chairman and the board now will appoint the CEO? So McLennan will have a huge hand in deciding which way that goes when Rob Clark says... Au revoir. I'm back off to the Mediterranean. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's that's it. I don't think Rob Clark's going to be involved at all in the the process of the CEO, which is good because you know he's he's got to just go and essentially work through this financial crisis that we're in. So Rob Clark is just going to run the operational side of things, and he's very good. Like he's a very good operator. He's been there before. He knows a lot of the staff. And and the nicest thing about this whole situation with Rob Clark being involved is 
there's no mo- there's no hidden agenda. There's 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 no there's no chance he wants to run the game. He's he clearly stated that he's here to fix it up in a short period of time and hand it over. So yeah, you know, I believe the new chairman and the board will will go through another process to find a, a CEO. Look, I just hope that doesn't take too long and. And, and sadly, a lot of these processes with recruitment companies, you all know, they cost money. I don't think we, look, going into our own CEO, and at the time, a lot of people thought that was mad. I probably thought for a little part of it, it was mad too. But then at the same time, I, I think we don't have time to waste. So I can see exactly what Wiggs was trying to do. It was trying to get on with it. So I just hope this doesn't drag out. And yeah. What do you think, yeah. Drew? But we can't get on with it at well, we can't just get on with it at the sake of just someone picking their mate yep. again. Like we, you know, one of the one at least the optics of rugby Australia is that it's a big boys club and it's one looking after the other, and it, it just becomes like a bit of a, a mates club. And and even if it, if that's not the case, at least that's the optics. And I I, I kind of I commend them going through now this due process. And I know that we don't have a great deal of time, nor do we have a great deal of cash at hand. But we also don't have the, we don't have the opportunity to make another poor decision and be back in this position in twelve months' time. One of the things that uh, I really like about uh, McLennan is his background on the Big Bash side of things, Lou. I know that you have that in the production notes as well, but that he was kind of at the forefront of the Big Bash when that really kick-started via free-to-air on Channel 10. I mean, to have someone like that who had that kind of vision early on, which in many ways transformed cricket and brought it into the mainstream through the middle part of the week, if that same sort of uh, special source can be applied to Super Rugby or whatever it looks like, I think that'll be a huge kick in the right direction, Lou Ransom. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Sean. And he comes with uh, such experience. You mentioned there, he's CEO of Channel 10. He's got um, experience at News Corp as an executive there as well. So he's got that sort of, uh, yeah, I guess that, that history behind him for this role. And yeah, if we can get that freshness, I guess, to rugby and the way it's presented, I think that will be a really exciting thing that hopefully he can implement and guys the other really exciting thing is that we have some rugby on the horizon now we've got the new yes, zealand uh... Uh, competition set to kick off i knew you'd be excited sean mid-june the kiwis are going to um, kick things off and then the aussie teams with potentially the western force as well they are hoping to start in the first week of july so being in in may now this all sounds nice and close sean you particularly, you were a fan of, what was it in the 90s? I mean, I, I was pretty young then, we it was all the, were, but if what we, was if it? If we spin it back, yeah, so Rico, if we're looking back to the days of the Rico Cup, so basically Super Rugby seasons would run, and then at the back end you'd have these sort of interstate games, and they were awesome. Like, there was a really good mix. There were some great guys coming on their way up through and out of grade ranks who then went on off the back of Rico Cup to play for state and then obviously play for play Super Rugby, then play for the Wallabies as well. So I'm excited by it. What concerns me a little bit, team, is the fact that the Western Force came out last week and said nobody has approached them about playing in any form of a domestic competition. Now, I'm thinking if you're probably going to start saying we've got a six, seven team set up going, you might actually speak to someone over in Perth and say, are you guys on board with this? How are we going? Your thoughts? Especially... Especially with the way they've kind of been treated, you know, by Rugby <laughs> Australia in the last couple of years. Surely you're going to mend that relationship as much as you can. Yeah, only in rugby could that happen. Yeah, we talk about clarity. That's, um, you know, the lack of clarity at, at its finest. But I did see that. I did see that. It came across my Twitter feed as well. But I also saw another comment where they said, have any of the other teams been spoken to? So maybe it's a, it's not just the Western Force. Maybe no one's been spoken to at the moment. <laughs> yeah, fair point. So so talking about those sort of two setups, we've got Kiwi teams playing each other, a domestic comp here in Australia. Looking forward, we know border restrictions will be in place in some way, shape or form for the foreseeable future. How do you see this sort of shaping up in the next six months, year or two, maybe looking to next year? What would you, Hoylesey, like to see in terms of the competition? Do you like the idea of the sort of trans-Tasman bubble? Do you like the idea of just a national comp here and linking up with the sort of shoot shield sides? What, what's your uh, idea? I don't like the idea of you know, five or 16 competition for this year to get us through, to get some footy played on our TVs, to get money back into the game. That that sounds great. That's a really good idea. But long-term or even next year, a five or 16 competition or conference where you're play each other two or three times. I don't think the fans will really get behind that. I, I believe you need to have at least a 10 or 12 team competition. How they do that, well, that's the other one. I don't think it can be through the NRC. There's The NRC's had um, a really poor follow-in. There's, there's no tribalism behind it. We've all either played it, called it, or, or watched it. it. It hasn't worked. So uh, I think 
where we've got the most success or the opportunity to have success is through our clubs that have been around for, you know, on average, most of these clubs in Sydney, Brisbane, Canberra and Perth and Melbourne have been around for 50 plus years, some 100 plus years. So I'd like to see a national comp considered. There, there would be, it would be nice to look at some part of the year where you have a, uh, an opportunity for a state of origin type series, but I don't think you know five Australian sides playing each other two or three times, and then jumping over and playing the Kiwis will work. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah, I mean for me, I you know I agree. I think we need to um, lean on our, our club system a lot more, but I don't think it should be our national com- uh, competition. I think I think that still that needs to sort of bridge the gap um, to Super Rugby. I think super, well Super Rugby or at least our state teams need to um, still be our focus. And I, but I, I think we need to have a sort. Um, a localised competition against Kiwis, perhaps a one or two um, Pacific Island nation teams and maybe Japan uh, if we have to get into another sort of thriving market to kind of tap into their cash. But otherwise, I would just say to have the Australian Kiwis and Pacific Islanders all in our you know primetime TV slots or streaming slots or however we're going to you know consume our rugby going forward. Um, I, I don't think we have the depth. We don't have the depth in, in Australian rugby, whether it's at club footy or, or anywhere, to have more than four professional teams I, I don't think and and I think you know the, the fact that you know we do we do consume it you know we, we do get around our our shoot shield or our Queensland Premier Rugby and and the others you know the other competitions in other states but the quality of TV and for that to be um, you know the I guess what we're relying on to get TV rights and sponsorship and stuff it's just not at high enough quality and they're not going to you know we don't we, we, we've spoken about rugby um, not not being as competitive as it should be uh, both in results, but also up against rugby league and, and AFL. I think it's, I think we've as a sport we've done poorly since we since the you know the turn of professionalism. Um, back in those days, everyone sort of talks about it now, where we go, well, why isn't it back in the in the golden era of the late nineties and the early two thousands, the Eels and the Gregans, the Larkins and these guys and the Horns and all that these guys that we grew up watching. But that was at a time where the game wasn't uh, professional, so these players weren't faced with financial decisions at, not, at, at grade nine, 14 years old, with a $50,000 $50, um, carrot dangled in front of you from the Rabbitohs or the Roosters or, or someone like that. And you, you know, we're talking about that young kid from Joey's now. That the Rabbitohs have said that they pay him $2 million once he turns 18 or something like that, some, like it's been reported. Like, who, who is going to stay in the game of rugby as a, as a 14-year-old with the opportunity of that? And, you know, you get to, you get to wear those, um, those clothes or, wear, or even just like to be – to be linked with one of those teams and stuff like that, like at 14 would be quite, um, you know, enticing. So I, I think a lot of that is also because you've got 16 rugby teams with a pathway, which you spoke about, Steve. So we need to get on top of that. We don't have, we don't have academies anymore. We have only got four professional teams with the Western force as well. Um, but we don't have academies like we used to have. So we, there's no clear pathway where we're going through that we can offer these 14 year olds that are having to make a decision between a professional contract with the Rabbitohs or, just keep playing rugby until you're 18, 19, and then you might get something with the Waratahs or the Brumbies or whoever. So, again, it goes back um, to to what we can offer and, and the pathways and that sort of thing. But we need to look at different ways to start attracting players to our game because all the best athletes are going to AFL, uh, rugby league or soccer, and, and we're, just not, we're not left with the depth to, to pick between to have a, a national competition just based solely on uh, on our club teams i believe anyway if you're going to do that so if we're going to go that way uh, and have that new zealand australia japanese pacific island thing one of the things that i reckon is just so easily waved away in terms of oh, it'll be sweet what does a pacific islands team look like where are they based who funds it how is it all set up what's the flow of players where does the money go where are the games held where are the teams based because as you guys know um pacific islanders are a very uh you know they're uh, parochial i guess and they're um they're very uh, what's the word i'm looking for they're very proud of their heritage and and what they bring to the table fiji and samoa when they play against each other in the pacific nations cup they try and belt each other into the ground so what does that look like we always say oh bring a pacific nations team in no dramas but how's that going to work like how is that going to work i want it to but what does it look like? You can't please everyone. You can't please Samoa, Tonga and Fiji. What you've got over the last three years, you've had the Fiji and Drua that are already in the competition. So that's the side that you can potentially start with. Like, That's the problem with the NRC. We, we didn't want to offend any of the clubs, so we wanted to start all these eight new sides. Like, We, we can't do that. Like, the, the big concern with, and I, I like the idea of being able to play against the Kiwis and the Pacific Islands and jumping into Asia, but the cost associated with that is massive. I look at the A-League, and even though the A-League is now probably struggling, We've got more rugby talent in this country than we do in comparison to soccer talent. 
And if the A-League can put on a competition that, you know, had great success at the start with new clubs, then surely rugby has the capacity to do it or at least look into it. But in answer to your Pacific Island question, Sean, we spend too much time t- 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 trying to please everyone. We've got to start somewhere and we could start with the Drua because they're already there. They're already a successful side. They've won the NRC. That's a start. We can't solve every problem, but I think it's a start. Are you guys resigned to the fact of losing players overseas to the likes of Japan, France? We've already seen Kurt Beale announce that he's going to go play in France. Um, Luke Jones is going there as well. Drew, do you get the feeling that we're going to see a little bit of a mass exodus going forward? Look, I, I think it's that's just going to be the state of the game going forward. I think we're not seeing it just in rugby Australia, but we're seeing it everywhere. Uh, I think we've got to be careful about what, what players' signings overseas we, we link to the state of the game in, in Australia or, or COVID-19 kind of uh, impacted decisions because I know that for a fact, um, Kirtley and, and Luke Jones, they, they made this decision months before coronavirus is even a thing, So, but it's just being announced now. So those kinds of players um, are at the back end of their career. They've done a lot for the game here in Australia. They've always wanted to um, uh, go back to France or go back overseas. Both of them have been there Previously, uh, you know, currently with the Wasps and and, um, and Luke Jones with Bordeaux. But what I what I think you'll see is um, probably some of the, the the fringe players, the ones that were probably at NRC level previously, start to look elsewhere. And we're seeing a lot of the younger players start to look at the MLR as an option over in the USA. Um, I, I think the 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 upper echelon of our players will probably start seeing Japan as as a result of the coronavirus thing um, all around the world. Probably Japan's the safest bet for any team. It's probably the most stable in terms of the, the financials and and get it, and actually getting paid because even some of the premiership clubs, there's a, there's a few that have been rumoured to be on the brink of having to sort of maybe go under because a lot of those clubs are, are owned um, well, individually by, you know, obviously some pretty wealthy individuals. But it's essentially, um, you know, it's it's extra cash that they got. They don't make their money through that. Um, you know, it's... Um, the first thing when, when you, I guess the purse string's starting to get tightened is, is you start to, you know, you start losing your hobby ventures and some of those for these men or these, these individuals that are involved in, you know, owning these teams up in the English Premiership are, are rugby teams. So, um, whereas if you look at Japan, it's all, it's all um, company-based, Coca-Cola, Mitsubishi, you're playing for large entities that can kind of cover um, their, their, their costs through times like we're, we're facing um, at the moment. So, um, look, I, I just think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a thing. Like, when we've only got maybe three or four potential professional teams in Australia that are playing uh, that are sorry that are paying a wage where you can actually survive off and not have to worry about uh, other uh, employment because your times are also taken up with training and things and it's just going to be a natural thing we see it in other sports we see it in other codes we are a global game and I think you know we always champion the fact that we're a global game we're, we're a game that's played you know all around the world but then but then we expect everyone just to stay in Australia like you can't have you know your cake and eat it on that on that basis. Um, so guys, I guess overall, do we feel that we've got a bit of an opportunity here as a rugby community to have a bit of a reset because of COVID-19, it's been a terrible, terrible time, but is there a sense there's almost a little bit of a blessing in disguise feeling that we can reassess where we're at and, and maybe put the right plan in faith, uh, place going forward? Yeah, I think we look at it, if you look at it a glass half full, a lot of people do say, yeah, this is our perfect time to make some significant change and make some decisions that will be the best thing for rugby in the next 10 or 20 years. For so long, we've basically continued to stay with Sansa and let the Super Rugby model go from Super 12 to 14 to 15 to 16 to 18. We've had so many changes with it that that's essentially where we lost the fans. When we you know, went into a conference system, which isn't really isn't something that Aussies are familiar with. So there is a, a huge optimism with some part of it, Lou, but there's also the, a bit of fear that if we don't get it right now, we could actually push this game further down the chain, which which is very scary. So we, now is probably the most important time in the history of the easily in the history of the professional game. So I'm optimistic that if we if we're brave and we're creative and we don't look for a short term fix, we look for a 10, 20 year fix that we can make something really unique out of rugby in Australia. But it's um at the same time if we don't get it right, it could be could be disastrous. Okay, well guys, uh. In our sort of isolation at home, I know we've all been doing different things. We've touched on Drew's painting. We've touched on the homeschooling sort of side of things for you, Hoylsey, and dealing with four kids at home as well, I'm sure, was challenging. Uh, Sean Maloney, you've been doing some chats for World Rugby, talking to a variety of people 
in the game. Who's been your favourite to talk to so far? I'll tell you what, I've rattled through a bunch of huge names. Lou had Artie Sevilla, obviously Drew Mitchell, massive, uh, Brian Habana. I know him. Uh, Carl and, Carl, I know you know him. Uh, <laughs> Carl and Isles, the fastest uh, rugby player in the world, the best women's 15s player in the world, Emily Scarrett, best sevens, Ruby Tui, a whole bunch of them. One I checked in with last week who... Uh, I spent a little bit of time with it at the World Cup last year. It was Ben Kay, who won the 2003 Rugby World Cup with England against Australia. And he is a real dude. So to spin you guys back, he had a moment to basically help uh, set England up with a match winning lead, a World Cup winning lead, and dropped a ball cold over the line. Like I'm talking Drew Mitchell, Western Force, Drew Mitchell, Western Force debut type skills, like non-existent. Um, so he gave he gave me this great yarn, and we're gonna we're gonna roll it out in a couple of weeks uh, on the World Rugby pages. But it gives the the story about the ticker tape parade through London and how that just all falls apart when the fun bus, Jason Leonard, has to basically do the drinking for the entire squad because he'd retired and they're about to keep playing and hilarity ensued. So loving it. Loving every second, Lou. Cool story, Hansel. Yeah, right. Sounds good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, drinking. Should we talk about drinking? Drew Mitchell, tell us about this business venture you've got going on. Yeah, look, a lot of people said that uh, coronavirus wasn't predicted by anyone. Well, I disagree because myself, Adam, actually, Cooper and Matt Guido, um, we, we thought, you know, something's on something's on the horizon and people are going to need alcohol and they're going to need it delivered because they're going to be stuck at home. So we started uh, our own wine company, which is uh, Backline Wines. So I've just uh, been consuming a little bit here over the, uh, the course of our chat. But look, it's a, uh, we, we ventured up with, um, oh, sorry, we partnered up with for this venture through um, I with a winemaker down in Adelaide named Ben Riggs. And uh, so he's based down there in Clarenvale. And we've been working on it for quite a while. We've got two two reds out at the moment, a Shiraz and a Cabernet blend. And uh, this week, our rosé was also um, bottled. So it was just something that, obviously, we, the three of us have spent time in, in France. Um, training's a little bit more relaxed, so you can start to indulge a little bit more with the wine and the other things that um, that, that France have to mm-hmm. offer. And, and from that, we kind of grew a bit of a passion and we wanted to come back and, and get involved in something now that we're sort of all... Well, we thought we were all at least retired, but now a couple of us, maybe three of us, are going to venture back into something. But um, it was just something for us to sort of stay connected, get something, um, you know, away from football that we could be uh, sort of sort of jump into and delve into. And we're, uh, yeah, uh, we're, look, we're looking forward to seeing how it goes. And at, at the very least, I've got plenty of wine at home to, to enjoy. So um, it's, not, it's not all bad. I'm just hoping in post-production that producer, our producers who are looking after this uh, little spot roll in the vision of you dancing through the vineyards with your good friend Adam Ashley Cooper. It's so sweet, Drew. It's its yeah. like you've just been married. I thought you should have a just married What concerns me the most shirt on your back. is the fact that Drew says when he played in France, it was a little bit more of a relaxed lifestyle and a relaxed approach to rugby. I don't think a guy could have been more relaxed in his professional career in Australian rugby, so I don't know what he did in France. If, if that was his relaxed version. Oh, mate. Yeah, if the, if the walls could talk. I mean, mate, France, uh, look, there, was, there were times where where I definitely sort of blew out over there in France because of the cheeses and the baguettes and, and the wines. And, you know, look, I, when I first went to Toulon, you'd go to training in the morning, you'd go for a team lunch and, um, you know, and there'd be wine and rosé on the table and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, that's Australian culture. Like, we drink to get drunk, right? And so, like, of course, I'll just get in. I'm like, oh, how good is this rosé? It's like, it's, it tastes like juice, you know? You can barely even, you don't even feel it. And so I'd get, like... I get well lubricated and then I don't, like, we have to go back to training. And, I, and then that's when it was like Western Force debut type of stuff. I couldn't catch anything in the afternoon sessions. And it, could, it took me a, a good two to three months to realize that these guys could just have a, have a glass of rosé, we will like, you know, cultured and refined, just have a little glass, have a sip and sip, and then just leave it at that, where I was just like, yeah, this is amazing. Like, how, how relaxed are these guys? So, um, yeah, look, I was a little bit relaxed over there, a little bit, perhaps a little bit too relaxed and um, had to rein it in every now and then. Is Drew Mitchell like the opposite of Michael Jordan in terms of athletes and being relaxed? <laughs> oh, no, like Michael Jordan. Yeah, was like <laughs> he still wanted to win. I'll give him credit. Like he used to, he used to get stuck in the like. So like, yeah. I think he probably just learned the fact that he could, he could do it on the field and he could do it off the field. Not many guys could do it that way. That's that's the, the art of it. I, I learned very early. I couldn't do both, so I stopped doing the other way. And some of the best in the in the history of the game could do it well. <laughs> yeah, there, there was also like Michael Jordan doesn't ask it doesn't ask or expect anything. Uh, of his team, teammates that he wouldn't do. 
yeah, I, I definitely ask things from my teammates that I wouldn't have done. <laughs> <laughs> I I, I brought up Michael Jordan. You guys know why? Because of uh, the the doco that's running at the moment, which I'm sure we've all either watched or seen bits and pieces of. Uh, have you sort of taken some, I guess, time to think about Hurlsey, uh, potentially the greatest player you, you've ever played with in your career, and um, I guess different elements from this doco that you've been able to sort of take take on board or, it, or think about. It has it hasn't changed my mind on who I think the best I played with were, but it, it's given it a new perspective like I always thought the best that I ever played on the field with was, was George Smith um, and, and he funnily enough was one of those guys that could be as, could be as social as the best of them as a matter of fact he probably was one of the best socially um, <laughs> social <laughs> yeah no he was just like what he could do like you know on the field was remarkable and you know he was very social off the field which which was awesome but McCall was probably Richie McCall is probably by, by far the best rugby player in our generation and he probably reminds me very much of, of Michael Jordan without knowing Richie all that well. But, you know, he was driven. He was, you know, he demanded excellence of people around him. So um, I think to be as good in, in that category, to be as good as Jordan and McCaw, you've got to have something. You, you've got to act a little bit differently. You've got to be wired differently. And that's what separates, you know, the best from the, yeah. the very good. And that's what makes, I think, McCaw up there right with, you know, with the Jordans. McCaw, in my opinion, is the best we've ever seen because... He got, he got better and better. I think his last game for the All Blacks was probably his best in that World Cup final in 2015. And you don't see that for guys that, you know, 34, 35 at the time. I want to know, uh, Drew, if you've yeah. got... So Halsey's Jordan is uh, McCaw. Who's your Jordan? Who's your Pippin? And who's your Rodman? Uh-huh. I asked this question last week of Tom Shanklin and uh, Dave Flatman. Who are your selections? Oh, mate, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know. Look, there, there's, there's been um, times where I've been sitting there watching that uh, The Last Dance documentary and, uh, and, and you just see certain parts of, of Michael Jordan or his, his um, standards or his, the way, or his approach or even just like some of his stare and you, and you start to liken it to different um, blokes that I've played with and, and there's a bit of George Gregan about Michael Jordan. Mm. Um, you know, like the standards that he drives, even like, you know, when you, when you don't quite meet his expectations um, and he gives you that stare or the glare and you just sort of like, you know, you cower away or you just sort of, you, you just, you just know that you haven't, you've let yourself down, you let him down, you let the team down, those types of things. So there, there'd been, I, um, I, I'm, I'm most intrigued about who my Rodman would be, to be honest. Um, I've got a Rodman. I'll quickly throw one. Is And you play with him, Drew. Hang on, Dave. Just shush. Um, this is, it's too much, this whole homeschool thing. Praise the teachers. I reckon my Rodman was, um, was Bucky's both are not not for anything off field just because of his sheer ability to want to hurt people on field like he was a proper enforcer you know like he was I don't think we came across yeah. someone who who really and I was lucky enough to play Barbarians game with him at the very end of my career and he was retired six months into it but he still and Drew you would have been more dressed in sheds than with him than I was he loved hurting people like he generally was a he was he played rugby to hurt people yeah. Mate, he did. I, uh, when I first got there as well, um, in, in Toulon, obviously you walk in, you're kind of like, it's just like, shit, you know, I'm playing against these guys. But Bucky's, um, you know, those South Africans, they like to kind of, they like to count their, their round and keep as many, as many, as much of it as they can before they take it back home. So he would ask me to, uh, to cut his hair in the dressing room. <laughs> and so I'm, you know, I've got him there and his shirt off and I've got the little like cape around there, over him and I'm like sort of trying to cut his hair and I'm thinking, Shit, if I, if I give Bucky's boat a, a rotten haircut, he's going to absolutely bash me. So, uh, yeah, so that was sort of the fear because of his intensity. But he's also one of those guys like, hey, my Aussie boot. You know, like he's just so different off the field that he is on the field. But I think also another guy at my time at it would be my Rodman, would be Castro Giovanni. And one story in particular, which which is very Rodman-esque, um, he, was, he had a calf injury. So he wasn't playing for Racing Metro at the time because he, uh, he left our, our team at Toulon. And, but he became good mates with a couple of the Argentinian players because Castro, whilst playing 130-odd tests for Italy, was actually born and grew up in Argentina. So uh, Angel Di Maria and a few of these players playing for Paris Saint-Germain in the, uh, in the, the French League uh, soccer, they'd just sewn up the, the French title, right? And it was midweek, and they, they still had maybe two or three games or something. But they said, listen, Castro, we've just won the title. We're getting a jet. We're going across to Vegas, like... Jump on with us, like come, come and come and celebrate. Zlatan Ibrahimovic is on the team, and all that sort of stuff. And and Castro's like, okay, no worries. And he's went to go to Leicester Tigers to uh to just support his team over there. 
but told the owner at Racing Metro that his grandma had passed and he was going home to her funeral <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and went went to Vegas went to Vegas and uh, and if it wasn't for Zlatan Ibrahimovic he he was out on one of the uh, the balconies at their, their penthouse at uh, in Vegas shirt off doing this dance and Big Castro who's 130 odd kilos long hair beard tattoos everywhere was next to these you know slighter framed uh, soccer players doing this little dance like this. And then it was like all the world media were Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Ibrahimovic parties in, in Vegas. But then the owner of uh, Racing Metro was like, hang on, that's our guy. He's meant to be in Argentina. <laughs> I might, I'm not sure. Maybe his, 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 his grandma was actually just unwell. So either way, uh, he was just meant to be back there anyway. But um... most, most grandmas of that age are unwell, so it was a white lie. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. So... Uh, but then uh, he tried to go home via um, Argentina to make it look like he still went there, but um, he got sacked nonetheless, and, and that was the last rugby he's ever played. So, but now he, he goes, he was texting me at the time. He goes, "Bro, I don't care. Like, th- it was the best party ever. I would do the same no matter what." Like, so um, he's, he's probably a bit more my Rodman. Um, but yeah, Greg's maybe my Jordan. Uh, don't know who the Pippin would be. <laughs> Bernie Larkin would probably be upset if I said it was him. <laughs> Very good. Well, guys, I reckon that's the end. Of the first episode of the only rugby show. It's been such a pleasure to uh, yeah. bring the band back together. Sean Maloney, Drew Mitchell, Stephen Hoyles, thank you so much. You never know. We might do this again one day. You reckon we'll get week two, dude? Let's, we can only hope. We can only hope. <laughs> Thanks to your company, wherever you're watching as well. See you next time.